and we are live once again with our 10th installment of the Think Fitness Life podcast with your host, myself, Matt Gluckman. And we have over in Massachusetts, we have Eric Menchi and Michael Urso. Really happy to have both you guys on this show indefinitely. Uh, otherwise, it would just be me rambling along here, trying to crack jokes and uh, <laughs> oh, failing <God>. miserably. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. You don't want to hear that. Uh, we have a good show today. We're going to be talking about the deadlift. And I guarantee, I can already probably guess that it's probably all three of ours favorite exercise. We're going to do our best just to keep it under an hour, guys. But before we get into uh, the open discussion, I w- we have a couple announcements. And I, I just want to say that next week... We have, um, we're going to dive into more of the science behind motivation. Uh, looking forward to talking about that with you guys. We had an email this week. So, for those of you who haven't heard it before, feel free to write in any email. We'll answer it live recorded on our podcast. It's thinkfitnesslife, all one word, at gmail.com. Again, that's thinkfitnesslife at gmail.com. So, before we answer that email, let's go ahead and knock out these announcements. I'll, we'll, we'll start with the most fun one first. Champions League. Bayern Munich versus Real Madrid played today, and it was a great matchup. Uh, unfortunately, Bayern couldn't really handle uh, being at home. They allowed two goals. So that sets them up for a disadvantage when they go play in Real. But it's looking like it's going to be a great tournament. Roma got their butt whooped by Liverpool yesterday. I don't think they're going to make a comeback from that but uh yeah so if you like soccer check out these games these are like some of the best athletic ability you will see and that's a lot of these guys um are i mean some of these guys are even like just 20 years old and it's phenomenal to see the performance on the field but yeah so let's go into some more announcements eric what do you got for us so i got a study done in japan on basically how your gut can drive your emotions and mood and behavior. And they said that your lifestyle can weaken your gut bacteria, which will cause a whole depression of the autonomic systems and kind of change your outlook on life and behavior. And I know that kind of has a lot to go with a lot of stuff we'll talk about next week, which is cool, but just kind of have people get a a feel for what's going on and what they're putting in their body. And I know Mike's got something to to do with the brain, but it's more on the muscle side. So I'll throw it over to him so he can add um, what he found in the news. Look at the Segway master delivering again. Yeah. we. uh, So I'm looking at a study and this was done in the UK. Pretty large group. This was nearly half a million people, something like 475,000 participants that they used the data from. And uh, we're looking at the connection essentially between muscular strength and brain health. So they did a bunch of tests with these people. And um, previously, some of these studies, they only showed that, you know, there was only correlations with elderly people. Uh, But because it's such a large um, pool to pick from, there was really consistently strong kind of data with people under 55 and people over 55. So Um, This was one of the first studies kind of to to look at the whole spectrum of of age category. And uh, they tested things like reaction speed, logical problem solving, um, memory tests in different ways. What's interesting, it's a little incomplete because they basically measured the muscular strength through a hand grip test. But what they did find was a, a really large correlation with hand grip strength and how healthy people's brains were. And um, I think it's pretty interesting because I actually use a method of kind of like a grip test to test people's nervous system health. It's like a form of readiness training um, before you, you know, I would take somebody through a training session and actually have them kind of grip two fingers and squeeze. And that grip strength, you know, prior to working out can actually give you an idea of the health of that person's autonomic nervous system. So I thought it's pretty interesting um, to see the study. Now it is complete. It's only measuring hand strength. But, uh, but cool to see like such a large group of people tested in a, in a pretty strong correlation. Now, were they trying to somehow correlate age to strength? Like was there a comparison in different age groups? There wasn't. I mean this was kind of just the full the full. They just spectrum. wanted to get a big population. Gotcha. Exactly. Gotcha. Like what's the correlation? The correlation was you know strongly that you know memory, reaction time, all of those things – Um, you know, brain health, essentially anything that correlates with brain health was dramatically higher with the people who had higher levels of grip strength. 
No matter what age, essentially. No matter what, no matter what age. And this was that's what's interesting about the study. It was the first of its kind where they looked at not just elderly people, but they looked at people of all ages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it seems like more and more they're they're starting to investigate. You know, not investigate, but um, in yeah, invest more of the science into youth and children. And you know, like one of the things I'm, I've been hearing a lot about. I know, from Mike, you have a friend that was doing it. I spoke to a woman the other day at my gym who's starting it up about yoga uh, with children and just the different benefits and transferable skills that. Um, are going to transcend to later in life and you, you catch them at a young age before they get these unhealthy habits or these um, poor behaviors that you have to sort of un, unwind as they get older. Yeah. Well, so I mean, cool. I'm thinking about like um, dementia and uh, how it's so, so strongly prevalent, prevalent with women um, later in age. And um, you know, one of the best ways to combat that or, or prevent it would be to move your body and to, you know, exercise physical activity. I mean, nutrition, obviously a part of it, but physical activity has a huge part in, uh, you know, maintaining the, the health of the brain. I think a lot of people forget about that. I mean, they think about these, you know, obviously said nutrition or these like mind games, but just regular physical activity has great implications for neuro health. And, people should be more aware of it. And I think that's a great study to have just thrown out there showing that, you know, there's a big correlation between this and people shouldn't just take, you know, working out as, as lightly as they do, or just for weight loss. I mean, it's overall system health. Yeah. Longevity. yeah and, I, and I would go as far as saying like, not just physical activity. Like, yeah, it's great if you went for a walk, like, you know, f an hour a day, five days a week, but you would actually be more beneficial to your brain health. If you did, you know, a five minute interval workout three days a week. So I think there's something to be said for that as well. All right, well, let's move on to, we have an email from Olivia and she asks, how do I get out of extension? Does it require more core work? And then she goes on to ask, is flexion, also flexion and extension, which is the enemy? And Olivia, first thought that comes to my head is, I'm curious as to why you want to get out of extension. What is the bigger picture? What's the goal there? And I don't want to give a specific answer that is just going to be incorrect towards what you're asking it for. Um, but I would say my first thought would just be, you know, to get out of extension would be to work on flexion. Uh, core work is never going to be harmful. And yeah, well, I'll, let, I'll let you yeah, guys take the floor on this one. It's we'll definitely off, a, a topic that, would take so much time and we'll probably do a further episode of flexion versus extension. But to kind of sum it up real quick, if you're in hyperextensions, you're overextended, you know, the best way, like you said, to get out of that extension pattern is, you know, working on getting more flexion through the system, you know, working on core work, working on breathing, but mainly if it's, you know, for a lift is you have to know, you know, an extended spine is, is extended and when what your end range of motion is kind of work obviously unweighted work with what you have to feel what getting out of extension feels like for a lot of people yeah i mean it's hard to answer this question without a whole lot of context um to yeah. your point we don't know really why you'd want to get out of extension or what the purpose is like it you know are are we in low back pain um, is there some sort of you know dysfunction that doesn't allow you to be able to complete a lift or you know uh, perform a, an exercise or an activity that you'd like to do otherwise. Um, so it's really hard to answer the question, but I would say, you know, if I'm focused on trying to get out of extension, well then yes, the opposite um, position would be, you know, working on flexion. I would want to know, you know, why I'm living in extension in the first place. So, you know, why are those, uh, why is the lumbar spine or those erectors, why are they hypertonic? So I want to focus on maybe getting into more of a posterior tilt, maybe focused on more anterior core work, um, some breath work to kind of calm that the, the the tonic muscles and and the nervous system to allow them to uh, kind of release, open up, and then I would want to train the hell out of the anterior core um, to make sure that I I maintain and lock in those positions, and then uh, I would want to focus on moving through a movement pattern that allows me to maintain that newly found position under load. Um, just to get the brain to to essentially 
um, click save on the document, so to speak. Um, but that would be my kind of general approach without having too much context. Yeah. So Olivia, seriously, please write in again and go ahead and elaborate a little bit more on the question. We're more than happy to answer it again on the next recording. Um, but to kind of touch on the last part of the, you know, which is the enemy flexion and extension, and it just comes back to, you know, being a, a balanced individual. I mean, it's like if, if somebody said, um, is fats the enemy or sugars the enemy or carbohydrates the enemy? You know, is too much protein the enemy? Well, you know, they all play a role and they all can be your best friend. They all can be your enemies. It just like what you said, or so it just kind of depends on the context and it kind of depends on the the balance and the and the imbalance, unfortunately. But yeah, I think that that kind of sums up what answers we can give now without kind of going too much in depth and possibly steering her in the wrong direction. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and dive into the deadlift where to start i I wanted to start with just a brief sort of synopsis right say the deadlift was like a movie and you were like reading off what it's about (laughs) i wanted like i don't want to start there so i know you two are the title be (laughs) yeah exactly well no the title's the deadlift and then like the little blurb is like the brief synopsis about the deadlift, you know, basically like importance and stance. Yeah, da, 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 da. So um, why don't you guys take this one? You guys are more book smart. I'm just, I'm just Mr. I'm like Charlie day. I'm just the wild to card describe, over here. To describe the deadlift. I mean, you're, you're go ahead. Aaron. So I, know yeah. I said the squats, like the, my favorite. So the deadlift's got to be my second, just overall, you know, badass exercise for optimal development of full body training. You know, you're going to get strength, you're going to get size, you're going to get, you know, CNS um, recruitment, you're going to get literally everything from one movement. And he used to describe like a, like a catchphrase under this movie. I don't know. No, not a catchphrase. I'm probably not, ex- you know, like deadlift, the weights on the ground, you step up to the so, bar. So yeah, I guess. So know, for people out there who pull it with a rounded don't back, deadlift no, is, don't do that. there's a couple different variations and <laughs> obviously I'll start with the, the conventional one is where you have a, a straight bar weights on the side and you're standing over the bar. The bar is on the ground. You get into a, a position where the hips are higher than the knees. Back is going to be straight or we call it neutral. Pull through the ground, so push your heels to the ground uh, yep, and yep. drive those hips into extension and stand up tall with that weight. And the whole reason it's called a deadlift is because you're starting from a dead stop. So there's no eccentric loading on this muscle action. So you have to recruit a lot of CNS and a lot of muscle fibers to get the initial pull off the ground. And that's why I think it's one of the one of the best exercises for development. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you. Just kind of you summed it up pretty well. Probably the only other thing I'd want to say is just uh, you know you're you're walking right up to the bar, and not, just in case people get confused because they are listening, like you're not standing on the bar that you get really hurt that way. So you're just walking up to the bar, and um, yeah, like you said, driving through, you're pushing your feet through the floor, driving your hips through, and uh, yeah, you don't get that stretch reflex. You're just kind of starting with that weight um, dead on the ground. So that's good. Ursa, what do you got? Give me like a 30-second synopsis of the deadlift. Well, the deadlift is – it's not a basic human movement. A hip hinge to me mm. is a basic human movement. Every deadlift is a hip hinge, but not every hip hinge oh, is, a, is deadlift. a deadlift. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Philosophical over yeah. there. So, uh. so, you know, a hip hinge is a basic human movement. Not everybody should be doing a deadlift, but in my opinion, everybody should be doing some variation of a hip oh, hinge. hinge. Right. Correct. And so I a deadlift agree. falls into that category of, of hip hinge. I always look for a more abstract view, obviously. But I think, um, it, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at that, this is an extremely important exercise for people. Reason being, most people are sedentary, sitting at a desk or, you know, sitting in their car, commuting to work, and then coming home after work and sitting on their couch and watching television. We're in a, we're in a flexed hip position for probably two thirds of the day. And when we're not, we're lying, we're lying down sleeping. So we need to get out of that pattern. And there is no better pattern to train than the deadlift because it is training that whole posterior chain that is on a kind of, you know, you know, completely lengthened, uh, weakened position throughout the course of the day. So this is a great way to put tension, put load, build strength, build stability into the whole posterior chain, meaning the, the back, 
the low back, the glutes, the hips, the hamstrings, everything. Um, and really, you know, those are the muscles that hold us upright and keep us standing up with good posture and don't allow us to kind of fall forward. So these are extremely important muscles to train. The deadlift is probably the king of training the posterior chain. I can, yeah, uh, that's great. I mean, uh, you know, this has been a great episode. Looks like we covered the deadlift in full pretty early <laughs> here, guys. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Uh, no, but yeah, I would I wholeheartedly agree. And I really think it's like one of the most important movements to include in your workouts. And you're right. It's more of a, a hinge should be in everybody's program, not necessarily the deadlift, but posterior chain, super important. You know, you're talking about alignment of your spine. You're talking about the efficiency of your central nervous system to your peripheral nervous system, you know, the, the best analogy I can have is like if you had a car and you have the wiring harness is kind of like your your um, spine and all of your nerve endings innervating off of your spine. Um, if that was out of alignment somehow or had poor connections to different spots, you know, you wouldn't have the most efficiently operating vehicle. And that's what you want your body to be, the most uh, strong it can be and most efficiently operating. And I feel like the deadlift is the best exercise for posterior chain work, which relates over to, you know, better alignment and stronger anatomical position. I know I mentioned, well, I'm big on the squat, but I think like Mike said, the deadlift is just as equally important or more important because you're now training someone could be possibly quad dominant throughout their whole life to activate muscles that they're not used to. For me, that that can be a lot more important for development or performance or just longevity than having someone squat. So when I'm always training, I'm always thinking, how can I get a deadlift or hip hinge pattern involved? So for me, the end goal is to get them to be deadlifting, whether that's trap bar, kettlebell, but to progress them through some sort of hip hinge, I think that's, I look at it as a more important than a quad or knee dominant exercise. Absolutely. And probably because we're already so quad dominant as a culture and very forward moving people. So we, we sometimes, I mean, you guys know, you've definitely find people who it takes you a little bit of some regress movements before they can even find their glutes. So um, yeah, I just think it's a, a a gluteal really, amnesia. Gluteal amnesia is right. I think it's a really underutilized tool to help bring the balance back in the body. You know, when you're loading this exercise, if you don't feel your glutes on, you're not doing the deadlift right. And I think a lot of people will get to a, a bar, a trap bar, and they'll feel their back on. They'll feel their hamstrings, but they don't get optimal glute activation through the whole lift. And that's where people listening, I would you want you to kind of hammer that home is you have to have the glutes on the whole time for development. You should never feel in that lower back consistently over time. Now, obviously if you're heavy lifting or a power lifter, you're going to get some of that because you're lifting heavy loads. But if you're starting off deadlifting, ideally I tell people you should never feel it in that lower back. Yeah. And we should, we should actually rewind a little bit and just explain that the deadlift is a purely hip dominant movement versus the squat, which you, you guys talked about a few weeks ago, which is more triple of as Matt, yeah, as Matt explained, triple extension, right? Where now as, as with squat, we're more looking at, you know, we set up in the same kind of foot position, but the hips and, you know, the, the, you know, the pelvis is dropping down straight between the feet in a squat. Uh, with a more of an upright torso, whereas with a a um, hip dominant hip hinge or deadlift, it's much more of a um, full hinging at the hip with a lot less knee bend and a lot more of a posterior shift of that weight. Um, so there's there's quite a difference between the two. And um, so what Eric was saying before, you know, we had you know the deadlift is so important or the hip hinge is so important to train the general population because of, you know, sitting postures and sedentary lifestyle. Um, but also for performance athletes, a lot of those positions that we see athletes in, you know, basketball players loading to jump for a vertical, for a rebound or a football you know, player yeah, lineman. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, a sprint, a jump, uh, a bound, any of those things kind of start in that hip hinge, you know, hips back ready to launch. We, you know, when you look at like a, a sprinter, right, it's, it's purely like hip extension that's going on. If you've seen like the sprinter's ass, it's, it's one of the most developed, well-developed muscles in, in human anatomy. 
Um, and that's for a good reason because the hips and the glutes are probably the most powerful muscle in our body simply because they have, they're so short and there's such a proximal attachment across the hip that it's able to, uh, create so much more power and so much more force. Um, if we don't train and develop that, we're leaving a lot of strength and power development on the table. Yeah. And you, you're right to mention that the glutes actually are the single largest muscle of the body. You know, if you, if you're collectively putting a large category of muscles together, yeah, the back's going to be larger, but one single muscle, the largest is your glutes. So yeah, it's, it's amazing to me, especially men. So many men do not, you know, you're like, yeah, we got to strengthen your glutes. Like what? You know what I mean? So yeah, we'll get into like different accessory works and different accessory work and stuff like that. But I want to talk a little bit about um, mistakes. I want to talk about some progressions, uh, some cueing techniques. Uh, so let's go into. Um, I want to hear. You know, what are the what's the most common mistake that you see done? Uh, that you want to kind of discuss here and help fix is when I see people go to a kettlebell or hex bar or even a bar, people want to squat that bar. They want to get their hips low. They want to get the quads on to pull that bar off the ground. So a lot of times I'll ask people what they feel and if they feel the front of the legs, I'm saying, well, we got to get those hips back a little bit more. And that's for me, that's probably the, the number one thing I see is people try to squat it and it's all over Instagram with these half squat deadlifts combos, which I'm sure we could debate that it's, it can be somewhat a beneficial exercise, another podcast. But if we're talking deadlifts, got to get more hip dominant. And then I think up the chain, once you, once people get their hips back, they start to round. And I think that's where you get this like over flexion of the spine and they, cause they don't know how to hip hinge properly. Yeah. And, and you know, it's tough to necessarily notice if you're doing that, um, you know, if you're listening right now and you're, you know, you're trying to figure out how to how to notice that, seriously, have somebody form check you or film film yourself and look at it, it or you know maybe go in front of a mirror. It is kind of difficult because you can't actually see your hip position, you can't see the positioning of your spine, but it goes a long way to get that feedback in some way so that you can understand you know one where your position is at at the current state and how to get in the correct position because unfortunately. Once you find out, it's too late. Like once you feel your lower back firing, and then you, you're doing too much and your form's wrong and you could possibly injure yourself. And worst case scenario, you could even slip a disc. Yeah, I, I would say um, not being able to maintain a, a, a neutral and stable spine. I think the prerequisite to being able to do a proper hip hinge, loaded or unloaded, is the ability to maintain a stable spine position. So whatever neutral is for you, um, in other words, you should be able to move through that through full flexion and extension of that hip, that posterior weight shift, um, and there should be no change in the position of the spine throughout that entire time. Um, whether you have you're doing a you know a unloaded reaching with your arms hip hinge, or whether you have you know 225 pounds on a barbell, that spine should not change going through that pattern, um, and you know you just leave yourself open to a whole bunch of, you know, disc issues and risks if you, uh, if you do uh, yeah. not maintain that core stability. That's the biggest one that I see. I like it. I like it. Yeah. You know, it's, what I have to say for the biggest mistake I see is kind of right along with spinal positioning, but um, I feel like it has to do everything with, with people's um, breathing and being able to, to block or uh, create that inner abdominal pressure or pressurization, if you, whatever you want to refer to it as. But basically, you know, being able to kind of, you know, stick your chest out, taking a deep breath and filling your lungs with air and stiffen everything in your abdominals to, to really contract those muscles. And you're going to have that what's called inner abdominal pressure, you know, shoulders are back. Um, and that's just going to help you when you're coming up from the movement to maintain that strong, stable spinal position and, and put all that tension into you know your hamstrings and your glutes. The spine is the most important part of this because the deadlift by far is probably the, the most taxing lift that a lifter can do. It has a greater axial load on the spine than a squat or any other exercise. So people need to be very careful when they're going to deadlift that they have proper mechanics of that cylinder and that pressure so they're not putting all this pressure 
on a spine that's trying to pull them up. Yeah, a lot of that comes too from the setup. So depending on if this is a loaded deadlift, I want that if and if my hip joint is the fulcrum, meaning that that main axis of rotation through the lift, I want that load as close to that axis of rotation as possible. That's going to put the least amount of stress on my spine and put the least amount of shear forces on my spine. So getting that if it's a barbell, I want that barbell all the way up against my shins, maybe like, you know, nearly right up against my shins. Um, and I, I want it kind of right over my midfoot position. And, um, if it's a kettlebell, I don't want it out in front of my toes. If, if I have to reach out in front of myself, I'm not going to be able to load my hips properly and I'm going to put more force onto my spine and, and make my spine have to overcome more load than it really should need to, um, to be able to complete that lift. Yeah. Essentially, from that positioning that Mike was just talking about, your shoulders are just over the bar a little bit and your your shoulder blades are engaged, your core is engaged, your hips are, are low and you're, you're really creating a vector. Like the weight's on the ground, your hands are grabbing the weight, shoulders are back, everything stays stable and those glutes move forward in such a way that that weight is pulled up just by everything else staying in engaged. You know, I think as, as much as we can kind of talk about this stuff, you're still going to find yourself getting into these mistakes and that's totally fine. Like as you go up in weight, you might notice that your back's a little bit more rounded and, you know, it might tell you, all right, I got to probably do a little bit more core work or maybe I need to work on eccentrically loading my myself, you know, like, like an RDL, like holding dumbbells and doing the reverse of the deadlift. Don't think that we ourselves haven't made these mistakes before and don't continuously notice when our form falters. Cause that's how you challenge yourself and, you know, don't be afraid to yeah, and I think- have bad form every now and then, but you got to get that feedback and you got to have that awareness so that you don't get hurt ultimately. Yeah. Just to add to that, um, my point before too, like with me making sure that the prerequisite to a proper deadlift and maintaining that trunk stability is that you is have, that good, is that, well, that you have good core stability, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the biggest thing. Like if I'm not training the plank and I'm not training core stability, I think about this, right? You guys talked about the squat. If you've seen somebody squat really heavy and towards the end of a set, when they start to fail at that squat, like when the form really starts to, to go to crap, what happens, right? They don't they don't really like just get stuck down in that position. Their whole torso dumps forward, right? Their hips still come up, but their torso kind of falls forward and then they kind of good morning it up. And same thing yeah. with the deadlift. What you see is a compromised spinal position, you know, and the spine just, you know, not being able to stabilize anymore when uh, when they get to that point when they're under, you know, duress and they're under their body's under so much fatigue and stress. So the idea is is that training that core stability and maintaining good, strong core position and core strength needs to be the prerequisite to, to these two movements, especially the deadlift, because those are the two things that we see fail when things, when, you know, when you start to get kind of, you know, a little sketchy and at the end of a lift, um, you always see the core go first before the actual legs give out. Right. Right. Literally my next question is, I want each each and every one of us to go through a zero to 60 progression, five moves or less. Like you take somebody who doesn't have a clue what you're doing in the gym and uh, yeah, five moves or less. So I always kind of progress the deadlift through certain movements. Like I'm not going to have right off the bat someone hex barring or conventional deadlifting. It's always a progression working up towards it. Usually I start with like hip hinge pattern, you know, can they get their hips back, feel their glutes on. And for me that that'll be start off in a supine position. So like a glute bridge, progress them up. And then I usually start with kettlebells and until you can really master a kettlebell, like get a hundred pound kettlebell deadlift with good form, you're staying at kettlebells for a while until I deem you, you know, capable core position, glutes, everything else of moving on to a hex bar. And for me, that's where I kind of end people. I'm a big hex bar guy. I love to hex bar. It just keeps the general population and more athletes in a neutral position with the hands by the side rather than a conventional gets the arms out front. And a lot of people can get screwed up with that. With the load coming forward, they'll try to put too much in the back. 
I find it can get a little, little dicey with the perceived threat of the lower back. So I don't even touch it with a lot of my clients. Yeah. I'm totally with Eric on, on the progression. I mean, I would definitely start somebody, um, probably in that just, you know, hip bridge position from supine, just lying on their back, focus on maintaining, you know, good core stability and good anterior core tension as they go up into full hip extension and just make them um, feel what it's like to kind of go through that extension pattern and feel that whole per- posterior chain turn on, then I'm going to maybe, I, I'll, I may stand them up and have them kind of pressing back to a wall or to, to Eric's point, give them a kettlebell. Because if I give them a kettlebell, they're, they can open up their legs, they can drop that kettlebell straight down between their feet and allow them to posteriorly shift more to really get into their hips better, um, as opposed to starting with a barbell right away. So that would definitely be the route I go before barbell even. Um, and then even after the barbell deadlift, I want to go into more dynamic or ballistic type of things like a kettlebell swing, you know, any, any of those type of movements that would create more explosive hip extension. And I'm even, you know, I have people, um, even older individuals, and I, I got to be careful with how I say older, but, you know, people in their 50s, 60s who are doing kind of relative strength and power type stuff with hip extension exercises. So I may have them in a tall kneeling position. So for those of you who don't know what tall kneeling is, it's, um, you know, on the ground, both knees on the ground, um, standing uh, nice and tall. And I might put a band around their waist, hook it up to an apparatus or some, you know, post behind them and have them do some sort of hip hinging from the tall kneeling position. And what it does is it kind of takes a little bit more of the fault out of it by allowing them to really sit back into their hips. And if they don't sit back properly, they'll actually fall backwards. So it allows them to sit back and then push out against the band and get more tension into that hip extension position. And that's that's one that I've used with pretty good success. Well, I don't really want to uh, give my answer now after you guys just went, but uh, here we go. Um, I, so how I usually progress it is I have people on the ground and just work on the dead bug first because I want everybody that I work with to be able to breathe through a movement while maintaining core control. And I love the dead bug to teach people how to contract the muscle but relax the diaphragm. Um, And then like you said, Mike, I'd go into a glute bridge, one to have them, you know, firing on their hamstrings and their glutes and working on that hip extension. And then I'd have them standing up and probably doing like a like a, a front loaded hinge, just kind of like hugging a, a, a light kettlebell to their chest and, and working on that hinge pattern, finding their hamstrings. Because um, I really like how that that weight in, the, in front like that helps people focus on maintaining their core and their spinal position. Because uh, right away you get that feedback. If you start flexing forward, you're going to put tension on your lower back. So it's like instant feedback. And then just right along with you guys, I, I would set up a kettlebell between their feet because I like how it can um, just kind of simplify the movement. And, you know, I can always add some some plates underneath the kettlebell and maybe work on like a kettlebell pull, just like the simple hinge before it even gets below their knees. I al- Yeah, I also like working the kettlebell to work on shoulder retraction before the pull. But yeah, that would be my one, two, three, four movements before getting somebody onto – either a hex bar or a flat bar. People need to start slow with it and get a feel for what's going on with their body. And it's just not a, it's not a, like Mike said, it's not an explosive movement. At first, be slow, be methodical. Make sure you're feeling everything on. Like Matt said, make sure you feel your core engaged as you come up. As your hips are driving forward, you should also be using your obliques to help pull that anterior hip forward and up so you don't lose that cylinder which we've talked about and i think that's a a good start for a lot of people is take it slow feel the muscles working then you progress to more speed more power more weight something too we um we didn't really touch on too and and that is you know what what are the goods that you need besides core stability just to be able to you know get yourself into a position at deadlift and for me um, I would say I'm going to try to make sure that that person can even touch their toes. And if they can't touch their toes, meaning like, you know, legs straight, standing up tall, reach down without bending your knees, shift your hips back and touch your fingertips to your toes. If you can't do that, I'm going to be very cautious on putting you into a position where you're under load 
um, and you don't have the even the ability to fully flex your spine without load first, um, I think, in my opinion, and these are some theories that would go along with uh, the joint by joint and core pendulum theory, which is a whole bunch of geeky scientific stuff we won't get into, but just essentially is in order for us to be able to to have like extension and be able to resist um, extension and resist flexion, we have to ha- be able to express full flexion of our spine. So in other words, we have to have a nice natural flex curve of our spine from our tailbone all the way to the base of our neck in order for us to be able to have the ability or the proprioception in our brain to be able to get into that position and be able to maintain it. So I want to make sure that somebody can not only, you know, hinge through their hip properly, can their spine flex all the way down? Do they have the goods essentially to be able to even start that that pattern and start to even, you know, get into training that pattern? If not, I may have to look into improving some of their tissue quality and making sure I'm doing some mobility work or some sort of motor control work that's going to put them into that optimal position to then start loading that that um, movement pattern and then you know training it from there on out. Yeah, you know what's great is we're actually continuously answering Olivia's question actually, <laughs> but I think I think another I guess we'll call it a prerequisite would be having somebody lie down and just an active uh, straight leg raise, you know, just, just having them pick up, keep one leg down, both legs extended out at the, at the knee and just pick up one leg. And, you know, if you can't get your foot over your hip or pretty close to it, then you're not, you, you don't have the proper mobility for a deadlift. You're going to literally compensate and get the rest of that, um, you're going to get the rest of the mobility through your low back and, and the rest of your posterior chain that you don't want. So, um, I'll, I'll throw a good practical, um, kind of test that anybody out there listening can do. And this will give you some good information on whether you need to focus on improving the, your mobility or if you need to focus on improving your core stability. And so that would be taking those two things, the one that Matt mentioned, which is you know, a fantastic way to kind of assess your hip hinging pattern, which would be lie on your back, do a single leg raise, see if you can get your leg up to, you know, at minimum 50 degrees, but ideally up to about 80, 90 degrees. If you can get that up to 80 or 90 degrees, great. Um, that's about where we want to be ideally with both legs. And then it, I also want to test out my toe touch. I want to do these two different assessments. So, you know, the single leg raise and the toe touch. Let's say, for example, I can lift my leg on my back up to 80 or 90 degrees, but I can't touch my toes. That inconsistent pattern means that there's probably a motor control issue. If, for example, I can't lift my leg up to 80 or 90 degrees and I also can't touch my toes, then that to me is going to tell me that there's a consistent pattern and that I probably need to work on mobility. So that means opening up maybe the hamstrings, posterior chain a little bit more. So Again, a consistent result is going to mean mobility. An inconsistent result is going to mean focus on more motor control. And I'm going to take it a step further. And if you can't get that leg up to 80, 90 degrees, but you can touch your toes, it means you have the mobility, but you lack the core strength to get that leg up. Correct. I would say that you're... In that situation specifically, most likely, not every occasion, but most likely what's happening is is when you're up touching your toes and your posterior weight shifting, you can load your core from a standing position and and you can hinge and and get through that full like 90 degree hip hinged position okay. But then when you're on your back and you're not stabilizing your core as you lift your legs, your pelvis – isn't anchoring down. And what's happening is, is your hamstrings, because your core isn't stabilizing, your hamstrings are grabbing and trying to do stability for your pelvis to kind of hold your pelvis in place. And that's, that's going to be an issue. That's going to, you know, if you're in a completely unloaded position where you're completely stable lying on the ground and your body isn't able to, you know, capture any kind of stability to help you go through a simple basic pattern, uh, movement pattern where you're unloaded, Um, you're going to have some trouble. So yes, Matt, great point. Hammer that core stability, find a way to kind of 
just engage, whether that's, I think for, for the exercise you mentioned previously, the dead bug, probably I would go right to that, right at that point, see if they can maintain yeah. that pelvic and, and uh, rib cage position. And then, you know, go through those arm and leg excursions and then go back into that pattern, lie on your back, see if you can engage that core, lift the leg and, and see if it doesn't change. If that's the case, then boom, you just fixed your problem. You know exactly what you need to work on. And what that's going to do is make your deadlift 10 times better because now you've, you've, you've reconnected, you've made a really good neurological connection from your core um, to making sure you can maintain that position. And, um, and then when you're under load, obviously, you know, you, uh, you want to continue to train that. And I think those are fantastic tests and, um, and real simple, you Results, don't need any equipment, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And and really simplified results and feedback from kind of what we just spoke about. You know, I want – actually, you know, Eric and, and Urso, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would go as far though in saying because I'm, I'm a very much a divergent thinker. I try to include everybody. If you went and did the active straight leg raise lying on the ground and you could get, say, one leg up to 90 – but the other leg couldn't get up to 45 or whatever. Maybe there was just a, a, a noticeable imbalance between the two. I would highly recommend finding a trainer, getting some assessments done, and having them work on you um, for at least four to six weeks to fix that problem. Because you don't you that is a accident and yes. long term injury waiting to happen. Yeah, the number one predictor of injury is previous injury. The number two predictor of injury is asymmetry. And if you have an asymmetry in a basic kind of split stance position or, you know, split kind of pelvic position like that, um, yeah, there's I mean, we're we're that's a pattern that we use every day. We're walking, we go upstairs that that's a recipe for disaster. There's repetitive use. That's just bad patterning happening there. And if we can't really even get that position when we're in an unloaded position on our back, fully stable on the ground, there's going to be a lot of issues that come about when we do get into the real world, you know, just, you know, you know, walking up a flight of stairs or walking up a flight of stairs yeah. with bags in your hand, grocery bags, you know, yeah. that that's when, that's when you hear, you know, people kind of throwing their back out or, you know, th th their knee starting to bother them. Like it's not when they're in the gym, it's when they're doing everyday life things. And it's all these things that, um, that you're in vulnerable and compromised positions throughout the course of the day. So you definitely need to assess, you definitely need to screen and kind of see where you lie on that kind of movement spectrum. Yeah, because everyone's going to have asymmetries. The body's built like that. Obviously, for people listening, don't expect to get active straight leg raises that are similar. You know, you're going to see some differences, but I totally agree with, with yeah. Matt. Like if you Go have ahead. questions or there's a big, you know, difference side to side, you know, ask for some advice. Go see a trainer. Ask them how they can – how you can kind of combat that. And I think Matt's dead bug core work, and I've kind of hammered that home with him a lot for a long time – is you know a big start to you know help setting that rib cage down and, and diaphragmatic breathing, but that goes a long way in resetting those asymmetrical patterns of the human body. Yeah, um, I just think I think it was important to mention because you know some of the other tests like they're they're simple that you get quick feedback and there are sort of uh, I guess you call it like a cookie cutter approach based upon the results you get but in an asymmetry there's just so many different things that could be going on and as much as we want to make people mindful and, and empower people through listening to this podcast uh, you know there's just going to be that time that you got to get a second opinion you got to get a, a professional look at it and uh, you know it never hurts you know obviously it's it only hurts you if you don't ask anybody to help you and you end up with an injury later well, with a lot of the asymmetries, the best thing, you know, talking about the deadlift is you can go into like single leg deadlift work. You can go into a lot of variations that you can train the deadlift in. Oh, you read my mind. That's my last question. All right, keep going. End goal doesn't have to be just a tra uh, trap bar or a conventional deadlift. I mean, we can get all different kind of grips. We can get single leg. We can get you know, if you, if someone can't get the bilateral down, you know, maybe have them in a staggered stance and then shift it back and have them feel the weight go to one foot and one glute, one hamstring. 
All right, well, you, you really got to my next question because we got 10 minutes left and uh, I unfortunately had to cross some questions out, but we'll go with with this question here. So, okay, we've we've hammered home the progression. We were up to the barbell uh, or the chat bar or whatever, and we're feeling more confident. How do we progress the deadlift further? And I, and I guess I'm sort of asking it, you know, what are your favorite – accessory movements to the deadlift and that can be a deadlift as well it could be a rack pull or chains or bands whatever you know what do you feel is the best exercise that will get you stronger and better at the deadlift to come to mind if i'm looking um in to get to more like explosive movement patterns kettlebell swing which i already mentioned before if you can get yourself progressed to a point where you can get go into single arm swings where now you're not only having to do explosive hip extension, but now you're having to overcome, um, rotational forces that are being put on the body. Um, where now, you know, your whole thoracic spine and shoulders are now going into rotation and you're having to overcome that rotation and build more stability through that transverse plane. Um, I love that one. And, uh, I mean, probably no better way to get more athletically strong and athletically powerful for, you know, some of your more explosive sports and performance stuff. And then I also like a, um, a hang clean, just like a regular barbell hang clean. It, it, you know, forces you into that kind of, you know, hips back position and forces you to get very explosive and, um, and, you know, getting, getting your pull going. So, um, it, it really makes you kind of understand the idea be, behind getting a whole lot of kind of strength and stability into your upper back, getting your shoulders really connected to the movement. Um, and, um, I would probably go with those two. I mean, they may be a little bit further down the line from just a regular deadlift, but, um, but I like those two, you know, to, to try to get to at some point. Yeah. I'd have to, I definitely have to agree because that my first kind of thought was, you know, for athletic population or, you know, high pe- or people that want to get into these explosive work, you know, the deadlift is going to progress you to clean pulls, high pulls, any kind of almost Olympic type lifting, um, which I think is great. And, you know, if clients can do that, by all means, get into that because that's just a, a full body stimulus. That's just going to be greater than the deadlift itself. But one of, one of the other kind of variations I love to use, and I think it's very very underutilized is the snatch grip deadlift. You don't see it very often, but I think people kind of forget, you know, going wide, you're going to get optimal upper trap development, glute hamstrings, just overall posterior chain development. And a lot of people don't train with that wide of a grip. So it's just a completely different stimulus. And if you're someone who's hit a plateau or stuck at a certain weight on a, the conventional at trap bar, it's a great way to throw into a program and help you kind of break that plateau because you're now training at a different vector, different, different feel. It's going to actually increase your strength. Yeah. That, that'll Uh, really get your mid traps going for sure. Yeah. The snatch grip deadlift is, which builds such a strong back. It's such a good movement. Um, and, and not, not the easiest at heavier weights. Um, but if I had to say my favorite accessory, to getting better at the deadlift or getting stronger at the deadlift if you're hitting plateaus or whatnot. Um, I would go with deficit pulls. I love uh, if I'm standing on a one-inch block or a two-inch block. I just love the fact that instead of that starting movement, I'm building strength through that starting position so that when I go back to um, a normal platform deadlift, I've already strengthened myself through that phase rather than being at the dead position essentially Uh, along with that um, I mean I'll couple these two together Uh, rarely would I do them kind of separately but I love deficit and mix with a pause uh, right after the pull right after you pull it off the ground pause for a two three count and then explosively finish that hip extension I just think it helps build so much strength in the glutes and the hips and the core um, yeah, those are probably my two favorite accessory deadlifts. So essentially you're deadlifting. <laughs> so I got, a, I got a question for you guys. Do you have any techniques that you've used, um, to kind of hack the deadlift with a client or, you know, with, with somebody you're teaching? 
hack it with a experience lifter or a beginner or like uh, let's let's say like an advanced cueing technique or some like a cueing technique or a a coaching technique that you've used to kind of teach somebody um you know how to how to really get into the position or or you know pull have a have a good pull um squeeze the hell out of the bar mm. Squeeze the hell out of the bar. Chalk up. Crush the bar. Get as strong of a grip as you can. That's going to externally rotate that humerus, and you're going to have a better uh, shoulder stability when you move through that movement. Um, I've had a couple guys kind of eager to get strength gains and had them do hook grip. And, yeah, it's a little bit of stress on the thumbs that you're not used to, but um, – yeah, some guys can add like another twenty pounds right away just by switching up that to that hook grip. And by hook grip, I mean you know the thumbs underneath and then wrapping your fingers around the thumbs. One big mind is obviously getting the position of hips back, but once I get that people into that position, I always notice people try to create that the almost that stretch shortening, almost slight eccentric to get momentum on the bar. So I'll say no, you got to take tension off the bar. So pull the bar up and create tension on with the bar and the glutes and not try to dip down and try to pull back up quick. Cause that's where I find a lot of people will strain a back cause they'll try to go down, load their body and then pull up against a dead weight and their body almost like a, it's like a slingshot effect where that there's a, at one point that tension, that back's got to take that tension. And that's what a, a big kind of cue that I like to use and tell people out there is, is you got to have tension at the bottom. You can't kind of think about I don't know, almost dipping and pulling off the ground and trying to get an explosive start. Like that is a no-go in my book. You know how there's – I think even saying pulling, you know, like uh, I I, – you know, obviously external cues over internal cues all day. But, you know, getting out of the idea of just because your hands are the bar means you're you're not going to pull that weight. Your first thing should be, yeah, pull those shoulders back and then Mm -hmm. push the floor away. And yep. that's going to move that weight. Yeah, I think when I I love that 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 cue and um, Eric, I'm totally with you. It's like when you can take the slack out of the system like that. Um, I always listen for, you know how like when you you have like when somebody pulls on the bar, or they jerk it off the ground, and the weights kind of still stay there. There's a little bit of play between the barbell and the weights, and where the weights sit on the barbell, you can hear a little clicking sound. When I ask somebody to take the slack out of the bar. I want them to pull up a, a like almost like ten to twenty percent, you know, to take that slack out of the system and disallow them from kind of jerking it. And if I hear that click, then I know that they didn't fully create full body tension before they initiated that pull. And so, actually, one of the best drills that I've ever um, seen or been coached with was from Gray Cook, and he just basically had a kettlebell um, and he you know sits between your feet, and all he says is. Matt, he uses your cue. He says, go down, grab the kettlebell handle, crush the grip, split the floor apart, squeeze your armpits as tight as you can, and all you're doing is standing right back up. And then I want you to go down again, rip the floor apart, squeeze your armpits, crush the handle, stand up again. And you go through that without even lifting up the kettlebell, just going down and gripping it and crushing the handle 20 times. And what it does is what you you realize doing 20 reps of that without even lifting it off the ground smokes your nervous system. But what it does is it fires up all those tiny little stabilizer muscles, which we need to fire up first anyway, before those prime movers do, do all the work. So what it does is, you know, you get that great neurological connection. And so then when you do actually go to try to lift that weight on the next set, it just flies up off the ground because you've made all of those great connections and you've created full body tension throughout all of those major, major joint systems in the body. Yeah. And, um, just to add a piece, just cause it just kind of reminded me of, of another, um, I guess misstep in the deadlift. Um, Oh, and real quick. So was you, you said you were, were you coached by Gray cook, like live in person or was this like, just his book you're no, reading? This was at a, um, I think a perform better seminar in Providence. I I've been to, that's awesome like 2011 maybe i've been to like you know most every year so uh i i don't recall which one it was it may have been just a couple years ago um charlie weingroff who also collaborated on fms and 
Uh, SFMA was also another guy who kind of teach those methods and principles on full body tension. Um, so yeah, de- definitely a cool experience to learn from, you know, Oh best. yeah. <laughs> Great cook. If you're, I mean, if, if anybody's listening to this, that is interested in getting into the industry or is a personal <laughs> trainer and you haven't read this book or heard of it movement by Gray cook, uh, it is, I mean, he's a, he's a pioneer. He's, he's brilliant. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this book does everything from screening, assessments, corrective strategies. Um, so that's awesome. I, I, I wish we could get him on the podcast one day. That'd be amazing. In due time. But, uh, yeah, exactly. When we're doing, we're filming episode 130 or something. But, um, yeah, so one thing I wanted to say was I see a lot of people, um, who when they go to a heavier rep range, say it's like, I don't know, 70% or higher. Uh, sure, if you're doing like one rep maxes, you're only going to do one rep, obviously. But if you're doing – for if you're, if, you're lift, if you're doing the deadlift for strength, you don't need to go over five or six reps anyway. But I see a lot of people who just do individual um, contractual pulls. And they don't stay engaged when they're doing that that downward phase of the movement. And there's a good article from Terry Long, one of the strongest football players and deadlifters of his time. And he talks about um, bounce reps. And I don't see enough people after that first pull continue the movement with everything engaged, you know, in a controlled fashion. Once you hit the ground, come right back up again. Uh, I think it just – such a great way to build strength in the deadlift. And and that's where you can get in trouble too. If you're, you're going fast on the, the lowering and you, you're trying to change direction to back up quick again, that's where you can get screwed up and take same thing. Tension comes off the system. So I tell, you know, tell people you got to control the movement down before you go fast. And if you can control the movement down coming quick, then if you can hit the ground with tension on and come back up, I'm fine with it. You know, that's a all right in my book, but for most people starting out, I don't think that they can, most people get to the top and then they just drop down quick because they think, okay, I'm done. Let me get to the ground as fast as I can. And that's when the lowering portion can really get screwed up. Yeah. Something we didn't talk about today too um, surprising it didn't come up was the difference between like a Romanian deadlift and a conventional deadlift. Um, and if we have a little time, we could just touch on it real quick, which, you know, to Matt, to your point, I agree with you wholeheartedly that when we're training like the deadlift for strength, um, I rarely would go over five reps at any point in time with that. Um, because then you're not really training for, for strength after that. And do you, you know, do you really use a deadlift for hypertrophy or endurance? Um, if I do, Right. I'm going to use a Romanian yeah, totally deadlift, which would one. be more of that top-down approach, meaning I'm going to start kind of in a fully extended position, and I'm going to go into more of a, um, I would say more of a, not a fully straight-legged position, but more of a purely hip-hinging position, um, and focus on not getting all the way down to the ground, and then I mean, coming back up to the top. So it's more of the Romanian deadlift for me is that top-down approach, and I would use that more so for high reps and focus on training the posterior chain for more endurance maybe yeah absolutely absolutely i I would i mean we could keep going on and on i just like to keep everything to an hour so that our our listeners you know will will, will listen to the whole episode because that's kind of the point you know i kind of want everybody to to hear everything we have to say and if if they're interested in listening to the podcast yeah that's true that's true but uh you know we can dive into that next time we we touch on uh the next exercise podcast we do, we can talk about uh, different. Yeah, we can we can re, we can even regress it. We can just compare the the hinge pattern and the squat pattern and a press and a pull and talk about all their importances and stuff like that. But I mean, there's just a lot to condense within an hour of the deadlift. I mean, we could sit down and talk for you know hours on end about different strategies and stuff. And I'm sure they'll be further down the road other podcasts with this stuff. So if you definitely have questions, you know, email us with your questions on the deadlift, because I think we covered a lot, but there's some stuff we just didn't cover and we could still need to cover further. Yeah. 
you know, we didn't even talk about like hand positioning or anything like that or foot positioning or yeah. yeah, all that stuff. So, um, you know, we can get into it at a later date, but let's go ahead and, and hit our, our closing statements. If you've never done it, start doing it. Don't shy away from it because you're, you're too afraid or you don't know what you're doing. Um, get help if you need to get some sort of way of getting feedback, whether again, if it's somebody watching you, if it's you filming yourself, um, even just doing a simple stand on a band and a, a, you know, a thin band, stand on a band, put it on your neck and just practice the hinge pattern on your own. And until you start to feel comfortable enough, that you're able to maintain good positioning and, and work your way to the deadlift. But, um, the worst thing you can do is, shy away from exercises because you think they're too difficult or too intricate to uh, learn. Like we said in the beginning, you know, exercise helps brain health. You know, if you're, you're willing to challenge your mind, you know, go learn the deadlift, challenge it, make yourself good at every movement, every aspect of it, start basic, work your way up. You know, it's one of the, the most essential posterior chain exercises you can be doing and probably one of the most taxing for your body. So if you're looking for, you know, strength increase, muscle increase, fat loss, um, across the board, athletic development, power, you know, the deadlift is definitely a way to go and definitely start adding that into your training routine. And you can be doing deadlifting once or twice a week, variations all throughout the week. You know, it just doesn't have to be one day, uh, but definitely make sure you're you're getting the the base down of position and activation of the deadlift first yeah deadlift is that one exercise that can make you potentially um stronger than any other exercise that you that you can potentially do and it's because you have the ability to load it more than any other exercise if you you know you should be able to deadlift more than you can squat you should be able to deadlift more than you can press you should be able to deadlift more than you can pull um and you don't need hand or wrist no, straps. No, because you know grip is extremely important, and if that's your limiting factor, that's what you need to work on. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that the the deadlift can be essentially one of the most dangerous exercises that you can do, and I can see why people have a fear of even trying it um, because they don't want to hurt their back. Or it can be the most effective exercise that you can put into your workout catalog that could potentially protect your back from risk and protect your back from injury and make you stronger and make your posture better and make your hips stronger and and make all of your lifts better. Um, It is that one exercise that actually has the potential to make you be able to actually bench press more without working on your bench press just because the sheer amount of, uh, you know, tension and output that it has to be created to pr- perform a proper uh, deadlift. So I would say, don't shy away from it. And to, to the point that we've been drilling in you know, the entire hour, seek help, thinkfitnesslife at gmail.com, send us videos um, of your of your deadlift, send us videos of your leg raise, your toe touch, we'll throw you back some pointers, we'll kind of help at least point you in the right direction or share some resources with you. Um, and, uh, and definitely follow up with some questions that you may have, uh, based on anything that we talked about today that we didn't, you know, um, dive deeper into. Yeah. You can also send like really cool dog videos. If you have a dog or a puppy or something, I'm a big dog. Yeah, I love guy, Frenchies. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That sums it up for the 10th episode of the think fitness life podcast, the deadlift. Thanks for listening. And like I said, next week, we're going to be going into the science behind motivation. I'm really excited about that podcast because just like anybody else who's listening, I'll probably be learning just along with you guys. And I'll be learning from these two geniuses over here. So thanks for listening, guys. Take care.